Right, yeah, so this evening I want to talk about research mobilities in the COVID era. Uh, well, we're just kind of out of it, at least in our part of the world. So we, I want to create a bit of perspective and, and document or assess what has been happening in that period and if it actually led to any kind of change in terms of mobility and the lessons that we learned uh, from this whole uh, era. And I think we have to acknowledge and we all know how central mobility is to our research uh, efforts. I think we already start with someone like Erasmus who uh, made a point that you know moving between universities within Europe is, is good for the mind, it exposes your mind, you have an exchange with other people. Uh, and it's, you know, the Erasmus grant is very much uh, made for that as kind of purpose. Uh, but of course, in recent decades or even maybe century, people have been going overseas to other countries uh, as well. And uh, that's been become part of the exchange and also exposure. Of course, we can have a discussion about how even that exchanges. We need easier to come from the north to the south than the other way around, especially with the issues of uh, visas uh, nowadays. Um, so I want to present uh, briefly my main arguments, uh, focus more generally, also situated within Zambia, how it played out specifically there. I think every country has its own story about how COVID un unfolded and what impact it had on internal and external mobilities. Uh, and then I want to see of, you know, how it challenged certain conventions that we have. Uh, and see what we've learned from it, or also how we're falling back into certain patterns uh, from before the COVID era. So some of my main arguments are like that the COVID pandemic uh, hastened the process that was already under underway. Uh, I think we've been talking about decolonization for quite some time. Uh, Black Lives Matter, I think, was also something that started paying attention uh, to this debate. Uh, and then COVID came on, on top of that and kind of changed uh, the whole setup uh, because now we could meet without physically present and suddenly we could belong uh, to either uh, side. But of course, it's amazing how quickly we fall back into the old patterns. Once COVID is done, we're all kind of traveling again. We're not thinking that much about the environment as we thought it would. Uh, and also some of those relations kind of uh, go back to the same, but I think some things have shifted. So this is something I want to discuss this evening. For Zambia itself was, uh, you know, as everywhere, the first few months were very difficult. We didn't know what was happening, what was going to be the consequences, whether our healthcare system would cope with it. And, and also, you know, we had people coming over from, we had people from Bergen University, from Denmark, and suddenly they had to make a decision very quickly, like, do we stay, do we have to go? Uh, university didn't know how to handle that. So it was a bit of a period of, of chaos, I would say. But, you know, researchers left because they were worried that they couldn't get any plane going back home anymore. Uh, so that whole period, also in Zambia itself, uh, the first few months, there was quite a few restrictions on internal mobility. And that really affected... Uh, Domestic transport, so bus drivers are complaining that their revenues went into decline. Marketeers said there were fewer people on the streets. But it was kind of short lived in Zambia. The government very quickly realized that we couldn't shut down an informal economy like ours. There was no safety net uh, for people. People make living mostly day to day, uh, so you can't really interfere uh, with that. So we had very quickly a decision that they said we. We leave the markets open, uh, people are allowed to travel. It's mainly in the formal sector that you saw some level of restrictions. So going into a shopping mall, you have to wear a mask, uh, you know, do your hygiene, uh, and civil servants had to rotate within their offices. But outside of that, life continued quite uh, as normal. And this was quite in contrast with some of our surrounding countries like Uganda or Zimbabwe, where the lockdowns were more severe. And to some extent, people linked it to maybe more authoritarian character of the regimes, making use of it to control. Uh, Zambia at the time was going through a bit of an authoritarian phase under uh, Lungu, and it, they did use COVID health regulation to suppress meetings of opposition. So in the run up to the 2021 elections, it was very difficult for opposition parties to get any permit to, to mobilize. The only way that uh, HHR, current president, was able to mobilize was to 
to do anti-COVID campaigns. They would go around handing out the masks and that was a way of, for him reaching out to the people, but he wasn't allowed otherwise. So there was some level of, of abusing COVID uh, to, to, to restrain civic space, but overall uh, things were pretty open and, and continued as normal. I think for us, the biggest hurdle to mobility was really external. Uh, like I said, you know, some of the plane, there was a, some planes, some companies that is flying to South Africa. And so suddenly it felt very strange that you no longer get an option. I was thinking like my parents live in the Netherlands and they're very old. Like if something happens, how do you even uh, get there? Uh, yeah, there was also some thinking about uh, a lot of our politicians are indeed when you get sick, you go to South Africa because if you want specialized healthcare, so suddenly people were more gleeful about it, saying like, oh, they're not going to rely more on, on the local healthcare. So there's a lot of debate about what COVID did to, uh, to mobility. I think at the same time, we also have to realize that, you know, we, we've got a heavy disease burden as it is, and it's a lot of contagious diseases. So for us going into a supermarket and washing your hand was already very common because we used to cholera epidemics uh, and all the other diseases. So I think for us, it was less overwhelming than elsewhere where people were no longer used to, to that kind of disease burden or being confronted with potentially deadly uh, disease. And so, you know, we interviewed people, we did some surveys around that time, and people like, you know, they list some of the so many diseases that were going on. Uh, and of course, there was also an issue like, do they really believe we had COVID? Because we, we didn't see that many deaths occurring, unlike other diseases. So there was also some level of cynicism about it. But we were confronted, especially the second or third wave, when we had the Omicron variant uh, in South Africa. And very quickly, they, they shut down. Travel to South Africa was forbidden, but because we're so much part of the transport network of South Africa, and suddenly that also meant, you know, Qatar Airways, Emirates were no longer flying to Zambia. We felt suddenly very isolated. And yet there was no pandemic really going on at the time. So it felt very strange. Uh, our cases, and here I have uh, this one, is a kind of overview of the committee cases. This is how the Ministry of Health was presenting uh, the, the cases uh, on a daily basis. And you can see the numbers were, were pretty low. We talked about 15,000, 20,000 cases. The number of deaths were pretty low. And um, of course, it's an underestimate. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in general in disease in Zambia. If you go look at the statistics, more than 80% of people die outside of hospital. Um, a colleague of mine did research uh, in the mortuarium around that time and tested people there to see people were brought in there, that's kind of a pedigree, and looked at yeah. how many people there had COVID and tried to establish if that was the primary or secondary cause of their deaths. So clearly there were more cases going on, um, but it wasn't a very heavy disease burden compared to others. Malaria was definitely still a bigger killer than anything else. And you know, there's still a lot of speculation about why that was different to the rest of the world, because youthful population is a very important factor. The fact that maybe we had other diseases which might have raised immunity. I think there's a lot of research going on still to figure out uh, why it played out so differently uh, in our part of the world compared to other uh, countries. So, of course, we all know that there was a bit of an explosion, not only of COVID, but also literature around COVID, and mm -hmm. kind of really caught people's imagination. And so if we talk about COVID-19 academic mobilities, um, uh, Daniela helped me kindly to look at through the literature that's being produced so far. Uh, and we thought, you know, we could see there was a lot of uh, focus on international academic mobility, people reflecting on what it meant, uh, like PhD students not being able to go into the field, um, but also, you know, people not able to travel to conferences and all of these things. There's a lot of in, also thinking about the impact on learning. So, I mean, like in Uganda, the schools closed for two years. Uh, in Zambia, they only closed, I think, only up to three to six months. And while there was this idea that we can do learning online in, in practice, that doesn't really work. Uh, most people don't have access to uh, online learning. So the university went online, uh, but the lecturers were complaining. They found it very difficult to get all their students 
uh, online. And so they realized that was that was quite a bit of a challenge. So there's, there's quite a bit of literature on that. And it's also very specifically, uh, you know, a lot of universities around the world have these kind of internationalization programs nowadays. Uh, the US especially, they feel they want the students to have more exposure outside of the US, whatever it's in relation to soft power or uh, learning. And of course, that was all halted sort of quite a few studies from the Southern perspective from Brazil and other countries, how they were dealing with that and how it has been, how these programs have been restarted now and thinking about how can we re renegotiate some of these relationships between the North and the South. Uh, also papers on research cooperation and the issue of knowledge co-production. I'll go a little bit more into detail about that. So there was a, a challenging of, of the conventions that we had with this corporate era. And here I quote uh, Sabelo, who was also thinking like, you know, because we, we've we suffered so many epidemics of different sites, uh, different sizes. And, uh, you know, I think in Europe, the last really big ones was the, the, the so-called Spanish flu uh, after the First World War. Uh, but in our part of the world, we've had so many more. And the feeling was like, you know, we could have learned more from the way we deal uh, with epidemics. Uh, there's been some knowledge created around that. I think some of it came to the fore in the, in the medical and health debates, uh, but I think a lot more could have been done. Uh, you know, the way we also responded immediately at the airports, I think, I remember traveling to the Netherlands, I was surprised I arrived at Sipol in the middle of the pandemic, there was nobody to check who you were, you didn't check, your status for Zambia, immediately we heard about the pandemic. There were, you know, health personnel at airports and checking uh, if you were positive, where you're traveling from. So there was much more tracking from the beginning uh, and that started much later. There was no resistance to wearing masks either in Zambia because again, being used to having to deal with diseases, people don't, didn't see that as an imposition uh, as such. And so this is one of the questions that was asked And no, as you all know, suddenly we were not able to attend conferences, we were not able to go to uh, webinars, but that, that was very interesting for me that suddenly I took part in meetings which I never took part of before. Uh, I'm a member of the Journal of South Netflix Studies, and we were always the advisory board in the South uh, because we couldn't participate physically in the meetings in London. And there was a discussion about how do we integrate scholars based in the South into into these uh, editorial boards. Um, but with COVID, something that uh, the process kind of quickened because now we were meeting online and we realized it doesn't really matter where you are. Uh, we can still have board meetings without me having to be in London to take part or all my colleagues in South Africa. Uh, so suddenly the integration of these boards took place uh, and everything has gone online, has stayed online um, as well. And so, yeah, there was this kind of realization that it doesn't, shouldn't matter where you are. I think with the coming of internet, that was already the case because, you know, you could be part of, of any meeting through email or have your input, but having the COVID and the Zoom and Teams meeting, uh, you know, really broke down a lot of those kind of barriers for us uh, in the South. I suddenly we could take part in conferences, which would be very expensive for us to travel to and, and to go to. It reignited the debates, as I said, on knowledge co-production, knowledge construction, uh, and the role of local research assistants. I'll go into that a little bit more. Of course, what happens as well, that people were desperate, you know, they had contracts, whether it was academic research or consultancy type of research, now suddenly they couldn't come and do it themselves. So they start asking our help to, to assist with them. Uh, so ODI asked me to do all their local interviews on anti-poverty study, uh, other people asked for hit local historians who could do work for them in the archives just to fill the gap for them not going into the fields. Uh, and of course, that it was interesting because suddenly we felt again there was a bit more shift of uh, bringing more work to, to us, uh, that they felt there was no longer need to fly people in specifically for certain jobs. And so that has caused a little bit of a shift. Uh, and for academics, you know, they have to negotiate this relationship with a local research uh, assistant, which they normally wouldn't have had if they were able to travel uh, themselves. Uh, 
Uh, then there was also the issue, uh, oh yeah, the regional cooperation, of course, suddenly we were discovering in the region, like, oh, we can have meetings with each other now, it's online anyway. Uh, none of us have the funding to travel, but online now we can have more interaction in the region. And I thought that was really good. And, and that's so far, uh, that regional cooperation has been enhanced uh, quite a bit since the COVID era. There was also more competition because suddenly more funds were, were put to the local uh, you know, consultancy and other work. And so you, you know, you've got kind of people positioning themselves to, to benefit from uh, local sources. There was also expert, experimentation with phone interviews. Uh, you know, there was one project by GLD in Sweden. They had been interviewing people on local governance in Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Zambia. And they, they, when they did, did the physical survey, they asked people for their phone numbers. So when COVID happened, they still had all these phone numbers and they thought, well, then we can do the same surveys using phone, uh, through the phone. And so that became a whole new field. So they were able to do surveys about COVID, how people were experiencing it, and other stuff. And so there's a bit of experiments about, can you replace physical field work with phone? work but again these things have come up but then they've kind of died down uh, now that COVID is over I think people still prefer the physical interaction so here are some pictures of interaction this was just before uh, the COVID this was in Malawi we had a Jesus uh, early career workshop where we had a meeting uh, with people and of course then we did the same a year later but it was then completely <laughs> online but like i said you know these this journal meetings or whatever it became more integrated and people became more part of it and we were able to reach more people so instead of doing a writer's workshop for a selected people who were able to, to fly to malawi we could now have like 100 students uh, or early career academics from the whole region to take part in a writer's workshop so you can really scale up things uh, by working online as well. So I think going hybrid is a way forward for us now. International conferences as well, like I said earlier, it's really difficult for us to attend ASA, ECAS, all those kind of conferences. It's, it's expensive um, to go to, uh, and the visa issue is always a constraint for that a part of the world. And so yeah, so suddenly again, we're, taking part in conferences which before were really difficult. Um, again, at the moment, they've gone offline again. Uh, it seems like it's been a trend. Uh, I mean, it's nice to see this workshop being hybrid, uh, but I see a lot of people going back to the old system of being physical rather than a hybrid version. So I don't know how we can push for some of these big conferences to be more hybrid again, since the technology is there. We've had a long discussion, a history of discussions about the use of local research assistance. So this is about how do you create the kind of knowledge co-production. And Lynn Schumacher uh, did an interesting book about Africanizing anthropology. She talked about the role of field work assistance to the famous anthropologists from the Rhodes Livingston Institute and University of Manchester. And Walima Kalusa, a prominent historian from Zambia, also on the role of African agents in knowledge uh, production. And I think, you know, I can hear there's a debate going on about that again in terms of the COVID dynamics and how uh, there was more emphasis again on the research assistance. And the research assistance can be very broadly defined. I mean, it can also be, I mean, that can be called a research assistance. Um, or it could be someone, you know, there's so many different levels in which people get hired to work on projects. Uh, and so I think that definition is important. It's also important to think about, uh, you know, to what at what state does somebody become a, a co-author uh, or not? To what extent do they really contribute substantially to the topic? Or is it purely for collection? And so this whole idea of, of extracting information uh, from the field uh, is something that has come up in a lot of debates. And I think it's an important debate to have. I find in the health sciences there's been more progress, there's been much more acknowledgement of which I think maybe there will be more challenged about the, the ethical side of medical research. And then you find more, I think they also work with more co-authorship, 
So you find people who are, you know, research assistants or work with them in the lab that acknowledged as uh, not as the first author, but in as one of the authors of articles. And in our sciences, we don't seem to do that. And I sometimes wonder if we should reconsider uh, that as well. Yeah, so there was a repositioning of, of roles. Uh, like I mentioned, the fieldwork from the par, demands on the local, the outsourcing of, of interviews, archival research. Um, but I also felt, you know, there's a wider trend going on there. I think in the past, researchers or anthropologists, they, they had years to come to the field and, and do their work. And there was funding for that. They were given time to do that. Uh, but now it seems funding has become also limited in, the, in what many of the Western universities. And so there's more a rush. People have to go into the field and have to very quickly get on the ground and be able to be effective because they feel they're under time pressure. Um, the competition has increased. I think people, you know, PhD students find it very difficult to get onto the job market afterwards. You get this very short term postdoc. Uh, positions and so from our perspectives from what I've seen from the 1990s I feel that there's many more people coming who have less time to engage uh, with the field work and I think we have to be careful to think about what it does in terms of um, you know the perspective of that that research can become a bit exploitative because there's a lot of pressure then suddenly on, on us on our side to produce quick you know people complain that the archives are not producing materials quick enough or i can't get an appointment with this minister and i'm like yeah we're living our own lives and you know that you have a time limit doesn't mean it's our time limit as well and so i think those pressures i think we have to be careful maybe also as supervisors or designers <laughs> brokers or design of funds to think about what does it mean to go onto the field and in terms of, of putting pressure on the local institutions or, uh, or staff there? So it's also about thinking about how can we define this research grant? So if we apply for these big research grants to do cooperation with between the disciplines, but also from <coughs> us, uh, Western universities and, and organizations on the ground, local universities or local institutions, about how can we think about to improve that kind of research cooperation. And it starts with the design of research grants. It starts also with the, what does you know certain grant organizations allow? Uh, I've been asked so many times to review grants for Western universities, and it, it always struck me that there's just really no space uh, for funding of local research. And there might be like a token box for a local workshop or a local conference for dissemination, but very little beyond that. Uh, and yet, if you look at the proposal, there will still be quite a demand on local institutions to cooperate with it. Uh, but they're not really factored in in terms of, uh, of budget and, and time. And it's something we, you know, we push back on uh, at times. I remember, you know, the grant application from, from Austria, in fact, and they were asked me to review it. And when I saw the whole setup, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm refusing to review this because I just don't agree with the principle of how this project is designed. And I think that's maybe something we have to do more to make them more aware. Uh, it's the same with, uh, I had a meeting with the University of Berkeley, they, they're kind of redesigning their programs, they're asking our opinions from the South, like how do we experience these research corporations? And again, the same issue came to the fore from uh, people in the South. And they also said like, you know, the grants make us, I mean, they're more interested in, in funding the PhD or the postdocs in these grants, which is pretty understandable. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you have to realize that if you go, and do work with local institution that there's a cost to it. And if you want to, you know, improve capacity all around, including local scholars, it's like, how do you build it into some of these research grants? That is an important question. Uh, and then to think about what are the assumptions about qualifications and experience, you know, sometimes you, you get roped into a, a research grant and then it's assumed that somehow we have less knowledge or we're less qualified then again, you have to push back to say, like, in fact, according to the terms of references, 
off the ground, you know, we've got more experience and expertise than you might have. And so it's about thinking about not making assumptions about where expertise and capacity lies, I think is an important issue. In this, all of this, there's also this lack of uh, local administrative capacities. So at the moment, I'm running a grant. Every three months, we have to we have to report back because there's such fundamental distrust about whether we're using the money or not, and it becomes impossible to to run the project because you can't run every three months. You can't give anyone long-term security. How do you get staffing if we don't know how long funding is going to last? And again, with COVID, I felt because they had to shift more funding to the south. Uh, again, there was a realization that maybe you know they, they should renegotiate this kind of cooperation and, and build more trust into local administrative capacities. And the ways of, of doing that. So it had an effect this COVID nineteen in that sense. We felt it uh, quite strongly, um, but a long way to go at the same time. Yeah, so this is all thinking about reassessing some of the power dynamics, which we were already, already doing, but I think we definitely uh, COVID raised those issues uh, quite sharply again. And so some interesting materials coming out, like co-producing knowledge and care in team-based fieldwork in the COVID era, because that was, of course, another thing, like you go into the field and, okay, COVID was not very a huge problem in Zambia, but people didn't die. Uh, and we found ourselves in, in projects. This was a FAO project where they wanted us to go into the field because they had that deadline. And we said, yeah, but there's a pandemic, you know. And this was instructed from Italy where everything was shut down. And then there was a push towards us that we had to do this field work. And, to, and we were in touch with people in Papua, Papua New Guinea who were put in the same situation. We're like, but this is double standards. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're allowed to shut down and protect your health and, and we were pushed uh, to do field work so in fact we refused to then to take part in it and so that, there was some kind of shocking interactions where we thought double standards were we shouldn't be shocked about it but that it does happen and this academic pandemic really brought that to the fore again and this paper also is really interesting about you know how they were working remotely with people on the ground it was a, an equal Cooperation, but of course, how do you then deal with the situation when somebody gets sick and gets COVID uh, and contractual obligations and deadlines, all these issues you have to deal with. So it's about you know, how can you be more empathetic in that whole situation? So the conclusion, I think, you know, I think you'll remember those kind of optimism around COVID that things will change, will change our the way we interact with each other. We would look more after the environment, we would travel less. Uh, you know, there was a lot of thinking that the post-COVID era would look very different from, from before. We were asking some very fundamental questions about society. Uh, and these are some very nice titles here, the case for decolonial love, uh, you know, how might we value mobility post-COVID? And yeah, how do you rethink relationship? But I feel we've kind of shifted away. <laughs> From that, so it's kind of going back to some of the old uh, patterns that we that we had. So back to the fault, uh, or are we you know, serious about pushing back on some issues together with the whole debate we're having with decolonization and other issues? Um, one thing that really struck me is about that visas are becoming really more difficult post COVID, and uh, so I'm going to conferences. Um, I'm, I'm dual citizen, so I can still travel quite easily, but it's been really difficult for my for my colleagues. In May, I had some conferences, one in Sweden, one in the Netherlands, and most of my colleagues were not able to travel. Uh, and yet, they spent quite a bit of money on it. There was no refund on that or anything else. Uh, and, you know, and there was this big case in Canada about this uh, UN AIDS conference, and I think the head of UN AIDS wasn't even able to travel. And so the excuse by Western governments was like, well, it's post-COVID, we don't have many staff, there's a huge backlog. But yeah, we were worried that there was something else going on, that they were using it to, to restrict uh, movement. And we have to see how it plays out, but I really do feel like, how can we 
think that differently about conferences. We've had a debate like can't we shift some of the conferences to the south uh, to make it more accessible uh, for people like ASA or other conferences, or you know, can't we just put more effort into making them hybrid and people able to? It doesn't replace physical interaction, but at least there's more exchange than without it. And of course, there are lessons for our side as well. I mean, we've learned a lot. We were confronted with issues and we had to push back. Uh, so it's about you know, how do we shift some of the power and how can we play our own role in it? How can we generate our own research funding? So we're less dependent on external funding, which always brings an unequal um, relationship because people where the money is, there's always more power than if you're on the receiving end. Um, so, you know, at Cycle, we've been really thinking about establishing our own endowment funds. We've got our own building, renting out uh, parts of it, just to think about how can we create own sources of funding and, and setting your own research agenda. The universities in our region have very little research funding, uh, except for South Africa. So that's, you know, it's, it's a big shortcoming. So for to a large extent, we're still very much dependent on external funding. Uh, push back against inequity, so push back against some of the funding models. And since people are thinking about it and we're being asked to comment on some of this cooperation, I think we we'll always make use of that to, to kind of speak out on it. Uh, of course, if we get more organized among ourselves, that could also really help to leverage. Uh, I think sometimes we are, there's competition or we cooperate with the North individually, but we don't really operate as a collective in the South. Uh, and then there's some very local, interesting local initiatives. In fact, I only found it today, uh, the Ubuntu Research Ethics. So they've been producing South Africa, African in research institutes that have come together and start defining what they feel are the local research ethics. Like, you know, what is it, the general rules about publications uh, and cooperation, but there's also something very specific, what they feel should happen. Uh, you know, to make it more community relevant, how do you co-produce research by engaging the local community so people get more to understand what research is about uh, and maybe can use it for whatever actions they want to undertake. And so I think that debate is coming up and it's really nice to see that that's also more increasingly defined within the region. Uh, and the same with open research and this whole debate about open access, because it's still extremely difficult to get access to literature where we are. The universities don't really have libraries. Online access is still uh, very difficult. Uh, but you can see there's a bit of a movement to, you know, open book, you know, people having open source uh, publications uh, or sharing it on research gates, uh, things like that is really helpful to have that full access to materials. And then I'll throw the question back to you. What are the other lessons that we can learn from all of this? This is where I end.